Hey, everyone. Um, welcome uh, to my first talk in NDC uh, about architecting your next single page application. Uh, my name is Guy Nesher, but we'll get to the details a little later. Um, and we'll start with a little bit of um, an agenda on what we're going to talk about today. So we're going to start about the state of single page applications and maybe JavaScript in general, just so we'll be on the same line. Um, and then we're going to talk about some of the best practices um, for building single page applications. I'm trying to highlight every time that I'm saying things that are my specific, um, uh, well, opinions, um, but I might not always catch these. So um, if you flag anything that seems suspicious, feel free to ask um, questions at the end of the presentation. Um, the last part really is about choosing um, or how to choose your next single page application library, um, because there's a few tips there, um, and I think a lot of us makes those mistakes. Um, uh, oh, um, at the end, we're going to have a short uh, question session. Um, there's a mic here. If that doesn't work, the details um, for contacting me are on the next slide. And feel free to send me emails or tweets. So let's start. Um, my name is Guy Nesher. I work as a consultant in a company called uh, Code Value in Israel. Uh, I worked at, in London for several years. I'm, I've been doing single page applications from the very beginning, from uh, when Backbone came out in around 2010, I think. Um, this is my email. Um, this is my Twitter. Uh, my Twitter is currently locked. So if you tweet to me it's not, and I'm not answering, it's not that I don't like you. It's that Twitter doesn't like me. Um, I can't open it without my Israeli scene, so um, it will take a few days. Um, I'd like to tr um, start my presentations with uh, some re reassuring words. Um, so trust me, I'm a lawyer. Um, I do this generally uh, for two purposes. A, because I think people uh, believe that lawyers um, are trustworthy people. Um, and the other part is that uh, I've obviously uh, made mistakes in the past, um, but I'm willing to admit them and move on. And I think that's a good thing when we're trying to talk about um, how to learn from past experience uh, says when building single page applications. Um, so with that short intro, let's start with actually um, presenting the subject we're talking about. So what's the state of single page applications? And we'll start, we'll start with a little bit of history. Um, the first examples of single page applications in the wild are from 2002 which is quite a while ago. Um, I think if you go to Wikipedia, there are actually still examples you can go to and load um, <coughs> examples from that time. Um, they weren't very successful, um, partially because the browsers that were available back then, like Internet Explorer 6, weren't the best example of modern web, um, web browsers. Um, but it's also the fact that JavaScript itself wasn't quite up to the task. Um, <clears throat> now, that doesn't mean that there weren't any um, interactive websites. Um, they were simply being built using different um, solutions like Flash. Um, 2003, we have Firefox. Uh, 2006, we have jQuery and cross-browser uh, compatibilities finally uh, mostly solved. Um, and 2009 is when modern JavaScript is finally um, arriving into um, existence. Um, and very shortly after that, the two main libraries that started the entire um, revolution of single page applications uh, come out. Uh, I don't know how many of you had the opportunity to use Backbone.js or AngularJS. Um, two very different libraries, um, but they became immensely popular very quickly. And what follows were dozens of other single page application libraries um, and million active projects uh, as we speak at the moment. Um, that also led to something called JavaScript fatigue, which I assume most of you have heard of. It's the idea that as a JavaScript developer, you need to reinvent yourself every other day because a new library is coming out. Um, it also talks about the fact that building a single page application or a JavaScript application is, is extremely complicated because we're using a whole set of tools like Grunt or Webpack or Babel just to get the application ready for browsers. Um, and we're going to touch um, that in my next slide. So these are the statistics of weekly NPM downloads of the top single page application libraries. And there's a lot of interesting details here. Um, now, I'm going to start by saying that I'm not 
100% sure that the NPM weekly download is the best statistic of the, the size of a community or the size of the um, individual libraries, but it was the best um, data I could find online. And we'll start at the very top with React, which has nearly 2.5 million weekly downloads, which is bigger than the rest of the entire single page application community. Um, it's been around for five years, and that's actually quite interesting because when we're talking about JavaScript fatigue and the fact that we need to reinvent ourselves every so often, um, React is the, the, the exact opposite. It's been around for five years, and while it did have some changes over the years, it's been mostly um, very stable. Um, if we go back, uh, if we go on to Angular and Vue, the next two contenders, um, they've both been around for a while. It's funny that Vue is generally considered the new key that's on the block, but has actually been around longer than Angular 2 or the modern version of Angular. Um, but even Angular 2, which is the, or Angular 6 at the moment, which is the newest edition, um, assuming we, we ignore AngularJS, has been around for almost two years now. Um, the interesting point here is that the number of weekly downloads plummets very drastically. So from 2.5 million down to 680, down to 360. Um, which just shows, uh, comes to show you that even though there's a lot of new libraries out there, um, the vast majority of production-ready applications do not use them. It doesn't mean that these new libraries aren't good and you shouldn't play with them, but I don't think anyone actually is going to expect you to build your next um, single-page application using a library that just came out. Um, AngularJS and Backbone um, are a, a funny surprise because both of them are no longer on, in active development. Um, and both have hundreds of thousands of weekly downloads. Again, a Backbone JS is a library that's almost eight years old and still has more than 200,000 weekly downloads, uh, which isn't again a, a, a good uh, demonstration of the Angular uh, of the JavaScript fatigue and the fact that we need to rewrite ourselves every other day. And then we have Ember JS, which has been around from almost the very beginning and has slowly been um, phasing out. Um, it used to be the third biggest library, but it's, it's quite um, far from their number at the moment. And then we have Preact, which is basically a faster copy of React with the same API um, with 53,000 um, weekly downloads. Um, other libraries like um, Aurelia or Elm has considerably less um, downloads, which means, again, that really um, anything below these um, libraries is unlikely to see a considerable production use um, in single page applications. Um, the second part of the JavaScript fatigue is all about the tooling and how much pain you have to go through when you want to set up a new application. Um, but this, again, isn't really the, f the, the case these days. With, um, I think from 2016, um, React has the React CLI. Angular 2 practically came out with a CLI of its own. And, and all, the re uh, all the other uh, libraries also provide you with a, a CLI um, that basically abstract all these tools. So we still use Webpack, we still use Babel, but we don't need to directly interact with them unless we decide to do something that's considerably different from what these CLIs are offering. Now, these CLIs aren't perfect, but in most use cases, I can come and start a production-ready app within minutes. Um, so let's um, start talking about the actual best practices for, for building single-page applications. And we'll, sa we'll start with something that's going to sound quite obvious to, to many of you. But small reusable components is a thing that we need to discuss. And we need to discuss it for two things. A, small reusable components weren't a thing when single page application initially started. So Backbone did not have that concept. And Angular kind of had that concept, but it didn't really come into proper use until much later. Um, and React made it popular in 2013. Um, so in a modern single page application, almost everything we're building is a component, uh, which is basically a user-defined DOM element. It's small, it's composable, it's reusable. Um, and we interact with it via the template. So we have inputs and outputs to every component. Um, 
This means that we have a couple of requirements to build a usable component, and we'll go over them. So the first one is to be able to easily switch a data source, because if you look to the right, um, to the drop-down example, if my reusable component is hard-coded to a list of countries, it's not very reusable, because as soon as I need to have a list of uh, cities, I'll need to rewrite a new component. Um, it needs to be configurable, so again, it doesn't always have to support it because some components simply don't need the configuration, but the ability in this case, for example, to have the dropdown move to the side or to the top is a, a configuration that we need to support. Um, it needs to notify us on data change because when we change the data within a component, we don't want to automatically modify the data in the app, and we'll get to that a little further down, uh, but we do need to know about that change. So some sort of an event notification or a callback system is a requirement. And the last, but certainly not least, is a contained CSS. Because if we get to a point where dropping a component within a page modifies the, the design of the page, then we have a very big problem. And this component is no longer reusable because it, it has a drastic effect on our pages. Um, in order to do that, we start by uh, using something called a container presentational um, mo a model component, which again started with React or with the React community when they found out that they needed a way of making those components very reusable. The idea is that we have a, a component um, that's called a container component that doesn't have a lot of visual effects. It basically, uh, think of it as a page. It, it decides the layout where to put the individual components, but that's roughly all it does from a view perspective. The other part of its work is how to handle all the data. First, with the data store, and secondly, with the components itself. So it will pass the, the modified data to each component and receive the um, events or notifications when these components change and decide what to do with the data. The presentational components, on the other hand, are as small as possible. Um, they have a single responsibility, so we, we are trying to avoid a scenario where the same component is able to do multiple uh, or provide multiple solutions because it makes the component larger and generally should be split to multiple components. Um, it handles the look and feel. It has minimal logic, uh, so whenever you have logic you want to put within a presentational component, you should try to put it um, externally in a utility file. Why? Because a lot of times this logic um, can be shared among multiple components and shouldn't be contained within your component. Um, it needs to be reusable, obviously, and we get to the point where we we're talking about one-way data binding. Um, so all of the top frameworks, which is library, React, and uh, library, Angular, React, and Vue.js, uh, all support automatically a, a one-way data binding, which means that whenever the container component or the parent component changes data, the child component automatically gets updated. However, if the child component changes its data, the parent is not immediately affected. And we're going to show you an example, or talk about an example, why this is important. Um, the, the result looks something like this. Um, there's not much to it, but basically the blue um, container is our container component. The green um, components are the presentational components. And we can see that each of those green um, elements has inputs and outputs that allow us to control and decide how it's rendered whereas the container component does the interaction with the data provider. So, so far, quite simple. Scoped styles, on the other hand, are a much more difficult uh, situation. Now, Angular and Vue offer scoped CSS uh, from the get-go. Um, Angular will automatically scope the CSS you assign to a component. With Vue, you have a view container, a view file, and you can add a scoped um, method to the styles and it'll become com um, scoped. React doesn't come with a built-in option, but there's a couple of libraries that will allow you um, to get the exact same results. The problem begins when you're trying to take this um, scoped uh, CSS scoped style 
and turn your component into a more reusable uh, component um, in the sense that when I created a red button and I put it within a certain element, I want the background color to be blue, which is a very uh, obvious uh, requirement, but becomes quite difficult when you're using scoped styles. Because the way scoped styles work is that the scoped CSS becomes very specific, and overriding it becomes quite difficult. Um, initially, we had a way of piercing that um, scoped styles uh, using the triple arrows, um, but these have become um, uh, no longer relevant within CSS. Angular is slowly removing them. Um, Vue still um, supports them, but you should avoid them because once um, the standards decide to um, stop using this solution, it's likely that the rest of the libraries will follow suit. Um, it leaves you with two real options on how to modify this, uh, your, your um, style component. The first way is using an extremely specific set of CSS rules, um, which can still override the, the style scope. And the other is to define which um, properties within the component can change and modify them using variables that you, or properties that you pass into the component. Neither of these options is perfect, and we are looking for better solutions, but that's the best option or the best solution we've found so far. Um, out of, for, for general knowledge, the reason why the triple arrows or the piercing capability was removed from CSS was because it, 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 people determined it's too powerful and was being misused in many cases. Um, two things that are not really related to um, scoped styles, but needed to be said. Um, BAM. I don't know how many of you have, um, are familiar with block element modifier. Um, it's a concept within CSS that tells you how to name your CSS classes and is used to um, ensure that you have a reusable and understandable um, style sheet. I think the vast majority of um, projects that I've worked with that had usable and, um, um, CSS styles um, used BAM. And I highly encourage you to have a look and read about this solution. Um, you don't need any library. It's pure syntax. Um, the other things that, um, and this is purely my opinion, is uh, SAS and LESS. Uh, SAS and LESS are preprocessors for CSS that added a few interesting functionalities. Um, first one being um, variables but variables are now mostly supported within CSS in all major browsers. Um, so that's uh, making a specific capability less relevant. And the other thing was the ability to have a hierarchical representation of your classes. So instead of doing a button dot red, you could do button and then within the uh, parameter, the curly brackets, have the classes. Um, which allowed you to write a much more simple CSS and much more readable uh, style sheet. Um, but at least in my experience, usually um, leads to the creation of very deep nesting and creates a set of classes that are completely unusable in other parts of your application. Um, now, this, is, th this can be solved by simply ensuring that you're using SAS and LESS properly. But since I think nine out of 10 projects I've been working on did not do that, I, I kind of tend to advise to avoid it altogether. Um, if, you do use to, if you do decide to use SAS or LESS, please try to avoid nesting or at least limit it to one or two levels. Um, let's move to the next uh, slide. Composition over inheritance. Mm. Now, composition over inheritance isn't really specific to single page applications or any of the libraries we're talking about. But it becomes really useful when you're talking about small reusable components. And it's specifically being recommended by both React and Vue. Um, the idea is that we move the logic or as much of the logic outside of the components and then again, have very small components that we can easily use, um, read, and test. Um, not going to go into details about composition over inheritance, because there's a lot of information out there. Um, I will say that there are some cases where inheritance is needed or can be helpful. Um, and all of the libraries do support inheritance. But generally speaking, if you get to a point where you're using inheritance within components, 
it's very likely you're doing something wrong, and you need to revisit this before um, you decide to move ahead. Um, uh, and this is probably the bigger part where we're trying to look at how components work within different libraries, again, the big three, um, and highlight some of the things that we can learn or that I found important. Uh, so the template engines, um, Vue and Angular use a very similar templating engine. Um, React decided to use JSX, which is an XML, HTML type thing. Um, it's a little scary at first, but uh, the learning curve is quite easy. Um, so I wouldn't use that specific change as a reason to avoid using React. Um, if you do like JSX, Vue.js does support uh, the use of JSX using a third-party um, plugin. Um, so templating engine has some differences, but isn't really a big issue. So I'm going to put that aside and talk about something slightly more important. So when you're looking at um, the MVC, there's a very um, basic um, notion of the separation between views and controllers. Um, and that's been the case for many, many years. Um, and Angular's built based on that notion. But when React came out, they basically said, listen, in 99% of the cases, the co controller and the view are tightly coupled. There's very few use cases where I'll take the same template and pass a different controller to it. On the other hand, if I put the uh, view and the controller together in a single file, it becomes a lot easier to see how small or big our component is becoming. Because in many cases, a component with very few JavaScript lines will include a lot of HTML. And that's generally a bad sign. Um, so what happened is that since the React creation in 2013, um, we have a, a joint a view and controller within React components. And Vue.js, uh, when, when it came out, or at least uh, these days, recommend you to use the same strategy um, with the creation of the .view files and the ability to have your template and your uh, JavaScript within the same file. Um, why am I telling you all of this? Um, I don't think that separate views are going to become a thing anytime in the future. But if you're using Angular, your ability to put the views within the uh, controller are very limited. Um, what I want you to try and avoid is, uh, and, and I've seen it done before, is people who are trying to take the views outside of React and Vue.js components. And that's probably something you're going to regret in the future, because that goes very much against where the, the community has decided to go forward with. Um, the next point is classes versus objects. Um, so I'm not going to go into details about how classes came into being within JavaScript. But I will say that classes aren't an inherent part of JavaScript, and uh, that inheritance within JavaScript works quite differently than other languages. Um, and while React and Angular both decided to adopt the classes syntax, uh, Vue.js is very much against it. Now, I'll start by saying, or I'll add that um, you can use classes with Vue.js, but you shouldn't, and I'll tell you why. Um, the reason why Vue.js is very much against the use of classes is that classes don't really add much um, in the sense of, com uh, of capabilities or um, code size or performance, really. And they gave the example of Angular and React when, when they um, explained that. So Angular really liked classes, but was unable to build the components they wanted with ES6 classes and had to add deco decorators in order to define a component. Now, I don't know if you've seen a, an Angular 2 component or have had the experience with decorators within other languages, but decorators are currently not part of uh, JavaScript. And if you're going to base your library on capabilities that aren't currently part of mainstream JavaScript, it means that classes themselves have, have a bit of an issue. The second thing is React and classes. Uh, React were the first um, company to adopt classes or made the big um, scene about adopting, uh, adopting classes within React. 
Um, but if you're going to check the React code base, you'll find something quite funny. React doesn't use classes within its code base because, um, as they said, they didn't really find much use of classes within their code base. And when they did find use for classes within their code base, the performance wasn't good enough. So um, I, uh, some people started saying that in 2018, what we're going to see is the abolish of class uses within libraries. I, I highly doubt that's going to happen. At the same time, I will not advise you to try and force the use of classes, as still something slightly broken with the way it's currently being implemented and used. Um, let's move on to com uh, component communication. Um, so React and Angular both take a very um, specific approach. Within React, you pass in callbacks to your child components that are then being called, uh, whereas Angular uses event emitters. Um, Vue supports both. Uh, there's no big advantages of either, at least none that I've seen, though you can verify callbacks, which isn't something you can do with an event emitter. So I can verify that my parent component passed in a callback, but I can't know how many people, if any, registered as to my event uh, emitter. It's not a big thing because I've never actually seen that being used, um, but that's something that you can keep in mind. Um, and the last thing is props. Um, if you've used React in the past, one of the most popular slash annoying things about React is that props, properties that you pass into React are immutable. And if you want to make any modification, you have to copy them to the internal state and then use them. Whereas within Angular, you're more than free to mo mutate your uh, properties. And with Vue, again, you can um, modified your properties, but you will get a, a warning saying that you probably shouldn't do that. And, and you shouldn't. Um, please do not mutate your properties. And the reason for that is the one-way binding we talked about. So if you get a set of properties and you start to modifying them directly within your component, they're not going to affect the parent component. However, if the parent component changes, it will override the changes that you were making within your component because of one-way binding. Um, this can result in lost data in quite a few scenarios, though it's less likely to happen if you don't have asynchronous actions within your apps. So unless you have web sockets or some polling system within your app, it's unlikely to happen. But once you're aware of this um, danger, continuing to use these uh, mutations will likely end in a bug sometimes in the future that will be very hard to debug because these things are quite hard um, to replicate, especially when asynchronous actions um, are um, related. Um, the last part um, that has, uh, that's related to um, components within single page applications um, is web components. I don't know how many of you were in the previous lecture here that was about the uh, rise of web components, um, but the technology has been um, in discussion for many, many years and is finally coming into flotation. It's not a single standard, it's a couple, um, and it will allow us to create custom DOM elements um, directly within our browsers without the need of a third-party library. Um, it's still not fully supported within all libraries, uh, within all browsers, but you do have libraries like Stencil um, that will allow you to do that. And Angular 6 is now um, officially supporting the ability to export web components. Why are they interesting? For two reasons. Um, one, because Part of the reason why components across all libraries are starting to look the same is because they're all starting to comply with the web component standard, because all of these libraries want to be able to export and import these web components. And the second thing is that while these libraries, especially Angular, does allow you to export web components, we're not there quite yet. So an Angular 6 web component will still include a vast majority of Angular 6 within it, which, make, which will make it the world's largest drop-down uh, component in size. Um, so be aware of this. It will start creeping in within, uh, I think, um, a matter of months. 
Um, and it means that uh, more and more things will become similar within the components of different libraries. Second thing we're going to talk about is state management and the need to have one. Um, so it's a funny thing that within the top three libraries, only Vue.js comes with a an official state management system, whereas both React and Angular um, allow you to make the decision whether you want one or not. But if you look at the market these days, um, state management is a very big thing, and in the vast majority of libraries out there, you will see some form of state management system implemented. Um, now, this started in around 2014 when Facebook um, introduces Flux, which is a new form or an alternative to MVC um, that focuses on unidirectional data flow. Now, I'm not going to, again, go into details about Flux because that kind of goes beyond the scope of our presentation, um, but I will focus on one um, main difference, and this is the way the store, the data layer, interacts with the view. Um, in traditional MVC, the view, was, uh, the view or the controller was able to directly modify the data within your data stores, which caused um, a lot of problems to Facebook where a single change would trigger a whole set of um, cascading effects because each of those data models will then update its own views and other data models. And it became very difficult to debug uh, problems in the app because a part of the app could very easily um, go out of state. They wouldn't receive an update because of a bug, but no error would be shown to the user. And 30 minutes later, the user complains about a problem where a certain component isn't acting the way it should, but you have no idea what caused that problem. Um, in order to handle data changes, you have an action and a dispatcher that basically means that when a view or a controller wants to make a data modification, it doesn't do it directly. It requests the change with the data that's needed to, to perform the change, and the store eventually decides how that change is implemented. The data is first changed throughout the app, and then the views are updated. Um, Sorry. Um, while Flux was a very nice idea, very few people are using Flux directly. Um, and in fact, Facebook itself for a very long time recommended the use of Redux. Um, Redux is a form of a refined version of Flux that uses the same concepts um, with a few changes. Uh, immutability of the data source is one of them. A single data source is another. Um, and it's the most popular solution out there today. Um, at the same time, there's a new set of solutions that are still based on Flux, roughly, um, but have um, embraced the concepts of reactivity. Um, they offer less boilerplate and do contain a little bit more, more magic. Um, you can see uh, MobX for React, Vuex, which is the built-in solution for uh, Vue.js, and NGXS. Um, all of them are easier to use than the original Flux or Redux, um, but they're all slightly newer. It doesn't mean that you shouldn't use them, um, but it does mean that depending on the library you're choosing, um, there's probably a best solution. So MobX for small, medium React apps is absolutely fine. If you're going to build a very large application, it might still be better to use Redux, as there's still a lot more experience with that. Um, Vue.js, um, the fact that they have a built-in state management makes Vuex the best solution, in my opinion. Redux can work with um, Vue.js, um, but the integration is, is much less seamless. Um, and for um, Angular, you have NGRX, which was the original variation of Redux. Um, it's still in use. It's still the most popular solution for Angular. Um, and NG NGXS is the newer alternative, which again offers a slightly um, more comfortable um, use. Um, all of these solutions come with a very powerful set of dev tools, um, and the first thing I would recommend is to learn how to use that because it's an, an excellent way to debug your application. Um, 
uh, we have usually connected those dev tools to an external logging system. So when an error is provided, a, a, when an error happens, even to an, a remote user, we can still get all the interactions, all these actions that the user has done. And that can um, vastly improve the way you can um, debug your system. Um, and this is, might be a little controversial, because um, not everyone likes them. But I highly recommend to always use a state management system. The reason for that is quite simple. Um, apps tend to grow. They don't tend to shrink. So even if you're building a relatively small application, or even a prototype, there's a good chance that this will continue to evolve, and very little chance it'll shrink over the years. Which means that it's better to start a, a little, with a little more robustness to your app, and then be able to easily grow, than to start an app that doesn't include some core capabilities that will make our lives as developers much harder in the future. Um, structuring your project. This is a really small one. Um, so the first examples we've seen on how to structure folders within um, applications was done based on the, on the type of the files. So you had a folder for components, a folder for directives, a folder for utilities. And this kind of worked for very small application, but completely fails when you grow to a large set of um, uh, modules. Um, and today, we generally advise to build application using, uh, by, by grouping of the um, feature you're developing. Um, there's two varieties. One of them um, just drops all the files within a single feature. The other, for larger features, you do break down the libraries based on their types. Um, it means that it makes it a lot easier for users to find the files that they're, use, um, they're looking for. Um, two things that you want to remember when doing this. A, avoid using capitalization for file names and library names. Some operating systems do not um, differentiate between lowercase and uppercase files and library names. And if you have two people um, submit the same file name, one with capital letters and the other in lowercase, Git will make your life very, very sad. Um, it happened to me more than once. Um, and it's one of those th things that you really want to avoid. Um, the other thing is to avoid deep nesting. So doing, uh, organizing your um, directories by feature is, is ex excellent. And if you have a feature that's currently specifically only used within a feature, you can put it there within that folder structure. But don't go any further than that, because features do tend to then show up in other areas of the code. And it becomes really hard to find the feature when there's four or five level deep nesting. Um, which moves us to um, the last part of, well, our last rule. And it's all to do with app maintenance. And it's not really a single rule, but a set of best practices that you really should adhere to. And we start with static typing. Now, I think the well most controversial, but possibly the best thing with Angular 2 is that it forces users to use um, TypeScript. If you've not used TypeScript, it's identical to JavaScript, but you have um, static typing for your variables. Um, uh, React or Facebook has a, an alternative library called Flow. Both can be used with whichever library you choose to use. Um, and it makes the development process um, easier. And more importantly, it makes it um, a lot easier to onboard um, new developers or maintain the app. Because it's a lot easier to see which data, which variables um, each component expects. Um, it does come with a certain cost, especially if you've never used static typing in JavaScript. Um, but the gains are relatively um, high. And since any serious application is going to spend a lot more time in maintenance than in development, that extra effort is, is worthwhile. The second part is long-term support, or LTS. Mm. 
which I think is a quite a big problem with single page applications, but isn't really discussed. So LTS is the um, support period after an app or after a library went out of active development. And this is the period where you just get critical bug fixes and security patches. And the situation at the moment with the single page uh, libraries is that you don't get it or barely get it. With Angular being the most generous, offering a year-long support, um, Vue currently offers about nine months for the, the migration between Vue 1 and 2, and React doesn't actually talk about it at all. Um, that means that you can never stop upgrading your app, um, because once you stop doing that, you're losing critical security flaw, or you might be um, leaving your app vulnerable to critical security flaws. It means that there's an extra cost of developing single page applications at the moment that a lot of people are not discussing. And it's something that you should be aware of when you're starting the development. Um, just to clarify, if you compare this um, to other libraries or other solutions uh, out there, whether it's Node.js uh, or Django or Ruby on Rails, you'll see much longer um, support uh, periods. Um, unit testing. Um, so <laughs> unit testing, I, I always laugh that unit testing is one of the questions you will always hear in a job interview. But when you challenge the interviewer and ask, so how many unit tests do you actually write in your JavaScript code, they, they tend to tell you that they're planning to start doing that tomorrow, but they haven't quite gotten to it yet. And we've been doing it for a couple of years now, and I think it's time to move on. Um, again, we're talking about applications that are being used by banks, by energy companies, that quite often have critical impact on the lives of, of our users. Um, and the fact that we're still kind of smiling and saying, eh, back-end de developers can, can do unit tests, we don't really need them at the moment, isn't a great sign of maturity for the community. Um, that doesn't mean that I'm always writing as many unit tests as I should. Um, I'm, I'm at fault here as anyone else. But you should give them a go. Um, unit tests have become considerably simpler than they were at the beginning. Um, AngularJS unit testing were not a, a pleasant thing to do. Angular 2 fixed a lot of these problems. Um, and all the libraries use a roughly similar um, set of um, tools for the unit testing process. So while um, I think um, React uses Jest, which is very much similar to Jasmine, the rest use Jasmine. So if you know how to, do, to write unit tests in one library, you're halfway to knowing how to use it in every other library. Um, it's, it's, it's a rather high investment initially, but again, the, the returns are quite high. Um, which move, uh, brings us to the last part of the talk, and this is uh, choosing your next single page application. And the obvious fir first question I always hear, which is performance. I don't believe that performance is a good question to ask when talking about single applications. And I'm going to explain to you why with two examples. The first one is the fact that um, there's about 10, maybe a little more, libraries that are faster than React, Angular, or Vue. With some of these libraries having a considerable uh, performance difference. In fact, there's a library called Surplus. I don't know if anyone heard about it. Um, that shows that they can use JSX, remove the virtual DOM React uses, and be 20% faster in some cases. And that's significant. And even though they've been out for a while now, and not a single developer in the room, I think, is using them, um, no, I think you should. I think the top three libraries that we've been talking about are fast enough. And while performance issues do exist, they generally do not come from, the, from problems within the library itself. They generally come with either improperly using that library or using um, bad calculations or animations within your own code. Um, the top three libraries, React, Vue, and Angular, perform roughly the same. So choosing one over the other because you think it performs better isn't something that holds water. 
Um, uh, I'm using a specific test that I found online. It seems to be the most comprehensive test. It goes um, and compares quite a few libraries, and you can run it on your local machine, um, so you're free to have a look. It also compares a lot of parameters. Um, the second thing about performance is load time. Um, I don't know how many of you have heard about GDPR. You probably got some emails from random companies wanting to be your friends or remain your friends. You probably ignored them. Um, so there's a story going online about a big US um, newspaper called USA Today. And USA Today couldn't be bothered making all the modifications for the EU, and they just simply dropped all the ads and all the um, tracking within their website, only for the EU c um, citizens. And the difference was about 5 megs. So the, si the site went down from 5.2 megabyte to 500k in a day. Now, that doesn't mean that when you're coming to choose your next single page library or building your library at that, um, that the size of the files you're going to send to the users are not relevant. They are. At the same time, I've had too many conversations or arguments about a 10K difference in a world where any production app adds so much crap that it just isn't relevant. So yes, keep track of what you're putting inside your app. And yes, the fact that Preact is a 3K library is great. But I wouldn't necessarily drop Preact for Preact just because I gained 20K um, or 50K in the end process. Um, let's talk about better criteria. Um, so community size. Um, NPM downloads is an excellent way of checking it, but you can also look at GitHub stars and follows. Um, you can also look at places like Stack Overflow to see how many people are asking questions about the library you want to use and how many answers are actually being um, submitted. Learning resources are very important, especially if you want to onboard um, new developers. Um, there's plenty of online videos um, that will go and teach you how to use um, every type of library out there. Um, the number, quality, and how recently they were written is very important. Because um, in things like Angular and AngularJS, um, but even with things like Redux or React, there have been changes over the years, and using a three, four-year-old video is generally um, un, un, un relevant, irrelevant. Um, um, additional capabilities. Um, I didn't, the talk covered the core capabilities that create a single page application. There's a lot of additional capabilities that can come with the library. Um, that can be form management, dependency injection, um, error handling, um, uh, which are only supported by some of the libraries. If you're going to use a very heavily depended um, forms application, Angular might be the best solution out there. You do need to be aware that no matter which library you're going to use, you're likely to use third-party solutions. Um, so I wouldn't be too worried about the fact that React is automatically bundled with whatever, with, with a router that is third party. Um, because that's quite standard. And Angular, which is supposed to provide you with everything, doesn't come with state management, and frankly, a rather broken internationalization uh, library, which means that if you need to support internationalization, um, you're probably going to use a third party uh, supplier anyway. Um, and the last point is, is personal preferences. Um, so I mean. <laughs> Your past experiences are going to significantly affect which library you're going to um, select. And that's not a bad thing. If you have a lot of experience with .NET, the move to, a to Angular is generally considered the, the most painless. Um, and you should be aware of these limitations and kind of embrace them instead of fighting them. Uh, and remember that the fact that Angular only has 600,000 weekly download or view only 300,000 weekly downloads versus the 2.5 million doesn't really make view or Angular any less um, acceptable for your daily use, because none of them is likely to go away in the near future. Um, and all of them have a large enough community that will be able to support whatever development um, you're going to make. 
Um, with this, we move to the questions part. Um, the presentation is already online on the following URL. This is my email. This is my Twitter account. You can tweet to me. I will not answer in the next week. Um, and uh, that's it. If anyone has questions, um, this is the mic. And I will do my best to find how to turn it on. Um, yes. Thank you. So raise your hands if you have questions. Um, if no one has questions, someone do have a question. I can't see you at all. The light shines directly in my eyes. Um, hi. Uh, you mentioned that Angular is the best solution for .NET. Um, Can you speak a little louder? Okay. I uh, you mentioned that Angular is the best choice for .NET developers. It's a, like the simplest uh, jump. Why is it so? Um, I think that the fact that uh, Angular was created with TypeScript means that a lot of the, um, and it has dependency injections, and it has a lot of core concepts that are much more familiar to .NET developers, whereas um, React, where you need to reinvent the entire uh, application and put together a lot of different libraries, um, is more daunting to, to .NET users. Um, the same with Vue.js, because um, you don't have classes, and suddenly they, they, they go outside of their comfort zone. It doesn't mean that they won't be able to learn Vue.js. It just will scare them a little more and maybe take them a little longer. Any other questions? What's the best uh, utility uh, testing framework for Angular? Um, the question was, what's the best utility for testing in Angular? I assume unit testing. Um, I've been using Jasmine forever. Um, I can't say if it's the best. I mean, they're all doing roughly the same thing. Uh, just writing tests is probably what you need to do, and everything else is kind of will we'll fall into place once you get used to the um, syntax. I, I've not seen any significant differences, at least. Is it the same as in uh, React, where you mount the components? Yes. In all of these libraries, you now mount the components. Um, the question was, do you mount the component in Angular? The answer is yes, and it, it goes across the board. Um, any other questions? I think there's. Uh, thanks for the talk. Uh, I have a question about the um, state management and uh, mainly the side effects. Like yes. how do you handle side effects, uh, asynchronous operations, and uh, since we're talking about SPAs, um, um, when you navigate away from one page to another, uh, you don't want to kind of tie tidy up after yourself. Maybe you have some requests pending. You don't. You just want to disregard them and move on to the next page. So. That's the question. OK. Um, so um, how do you uh, handle side effects is a question that kind of started with Redux and the uh, immutable data store. Um, and is being treated slightly differently within um, every solution out there. Um, so I, I can't really give a clear um, answer to that. Um, Redux has thunk and um, Oh, I forgot, there's another one um, that specifically helps you yeah, um, to um, handle side effects. Um, and I think Mobix um, has a, something called side effect or something like that, which affects, I think, that allows you to handle effects um, when an action happens. Um, but each one of them has a specific way of handling those side effects. Um, they do it mostly the same. They just have slightly different names. Um, uh, I've seen people who are too bothered with um, side effects and take, uh, decided to take them out of Redux. So the original Ajax calls do, do, does not uh, fire an action, only the result. Um, I wouldn't go down that route. It just makes it maybe a little simpler at the beginning, but um, you lose a whole set of um, actions and the ability to track what happened. No problem. Um, uh, Anything else, or shall we call it a day? You didn't mention at all end-to-end -end testing. <sighs> You're right. Um, have you done it before, and uh, which kind of uh, frameworks have you, have you dealt with? 
Um, okay, the question is about end-to-end -end testing. I'll be honest and say that I've only done end-to-end -end testing with Angular and AngularJS. Um, I've used Protractor. Um, it's a very easy way to set up a set of sanity checks. Um, so end-to-end -end testing basically means that I have a script that controls the browser and tells me whether expected things happened. So I make several large flows in the app, like registration, like adding a comment, and I verify that I'm able to add a comment even after changes happen to the app. It's really good, again, for the initial... Um, I mean, if you don't have unit tests, it's an excellent way of adding some form of testing because it means that when you make these changes, you can at least be certain that the main flows of the app just work. Um, maintaining it is extremely painful because every change you make to the UI will require you to change sometimes quite a few of these uh, tests. Um, so, I mean, I'd start with unit tests unless you don't have any and you have a, a already a, a pre-made app, at which point, yes, um, starting with end-to-end -end tests might be the easiest way of adding some sanity to your development process. I hope that answers the question. Um, that's it. Um, so it's been a pleasure. I hope you enjoyed the talk. Um, there's a box outside. Um, put the correct colors based on how well or badly you think I've uh, given this talk. Um, and I'll be around for questions later. Thank you very much.